<clears throat> as Taylor mentioned, uh, you guys gave almost five thousand dollars a cup of cool water, and so yeah, let's let's applaud that. That is phenomenal. Uh, for those of you who aren't here, the last couple of weeks as we've been uh, pushing to to give to them, it's a ministry downtown that reaches out to teenagers and young adults and helps them get off the street and get educated, a place to shower, get fed, just find safety and solace uh, for a time and, and get them back up on their feet and moving forward in their life to where they no longer have to be living on the streets in fear um, and just the, the depravity that comes to, with living on the streets. And it's an amazing ministry that Pastor Jason's been involved with for two years now, Jason? Almost two years? Yeah. And uh, he goes down there every Friday and serves faithfully. Um, and so we felt like we wanted to give our Christmas offering, and you guys did a great job for a small little church. Five grand's nothing to sneeze at. And so God bless you all for your generosity to help those who are in the trenches. Um, ah, just really fantastic. So far, um, I have survived this series. And that's about the most I can say for myself in honesty. <laughs> this has been a hard season uh, for me personally. Um, and this series has made me have to look at myself in ways that I have not wanted to. Um, in ways that uh, have been painful and hard. And realize that there's a lot, of, a lot of growth in this rocky soil of a heart still that needs to happen. Um, Surprise. <laughs> I'm not perfect. And yet they give me a microphone every week anyways. Far from it. I've been working, this is the last night in our series of hidden hope in the hurting heart. And we've been working out this verse in Matthew 13. I'll just read it to you real quick. This is Jesus talking about when the kingdom of God, the hope of the gospel is preached to people. It's like a seed. And he says, as for the seed that was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word immediately and receives it with joy. Yet has no root in himself, but endures for a little while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. We've talked about how this, this idea that so often what happens is we'll hear the good news of the gospel. We'll hear what Jesus has, has come to deliver to us, which is life and life abundant, that when we repent of our sins, when we acknowledge that we are broken and in need and that there is nothing in us that can come to God and say that here's what I have to offer you, but we actually come to God humbly and broken, that he receives us. When we ask for forgiveness, he forgives and he pours out his, his life on us and he covers all our sins. He redeems us from everything. He pays the price for the penalty of sin, which is death that all of us deserve. And we might hear this message and go, man, that is amazing good news. I've done some crap in my life. I need that. And we hear promises as, as we start to walk with this, this Jesus character, this Son of God, this God in the flesh. And we, and we hear promises about God's goodness for us. And then what, what Jesus is talking about here is that what happens is there's circumstances in our life. There's pressure on the word. There's pressure on the promises. There's pressure on the truth that's been spoken to our lives. And in the word in the Greek that we've looked at is it actually, it starts to get twisted and perverted in our heart. And so what, what this means is that we, sometimes what happens when we have rocks, when we have these wounds, when we have these unmet expectations, we have these promises from God that seem to be delayed or they seem to have just died. Like God, where were you in my greatest time of need? When you said you would provide, when you said you'd comfort, where were you when I was hurting most? Where were you when I needed you most? And our experience starts to change what we believe to be true about God and his word. And eventually it twists and manipulates to a point that where when the pressure gets hard enough, it gets heavy enough, we just walk away from God. And we lose our hope, the hope of salvation, the hope of, of God living inside of us, that he actually cares, that he actually will do something with our broken little life, that he actually has the power and the love to overcome all that we've experienced and all that we've done. And the hope for anything good from him starts to fade and we start to lose our faith. In the first three weeks, we kind of talked about how we deal with persecution, with the pressures, with, with trials in our life, and that they, they kind of come from two main sources. Not that they're the only two sources, but they're two sources we clearly see in Scripture, and there's two things that we need to understand on. That's is that we, we still sin. 
I'm saved by grace. I didn't earn my salvation, but I'm still a man in process. And when I sin, there are consequences. When I don't do what God has intended me, created me to do, there are consequences in my life. And I can have these unmet expectations. I can have situations in my life. And other people might play a part, but really what's happening is I have positioned myself not to receive from God in this season of my life. And, and we have to repent. Whenever we repent, we talked about how God completely renews us, completely restores us and makes those hopes come alive in us again. But we have to come to this place of repenting before the Lord, to saying, look, I had one way of thinking about life and how I was supposed to live and think, and you have a different way. And repentance, based at its basic understanding, we talked about its basic meaning, rather, is that I'm going to turn from my point of view to your point of view, God. I'm going to look at things your way instead of looking at things my way, and I'm going to live your way instead of living my way. And then the following week after that, we talked about the, there's, we live in a broken world. Turn on the news. Open any social media app you have. The amount of hate and brokenness that is spewed from person to person all over our world in the macro sense to the individual relational sense is just disheartening at least. And sometimes because we live in a broken world, because sin, this rebellion against God's word came into creation when we sinned, when Adam and Eve sinned, because that came into creation, this world itself is broken. We experience death. We experience cancer. We experience all forms of loss and struggle in life. And sometimes it has nothing to do with whether you have sinned and this is brought in. God is not punishing you for anything. But this is the, this is the, the world we live in because of the broken state that it is at this point. And that even in those times, God's goodness and his grace, when we see these trials, that they're not always for us to get out of so quickly. But that God is using it because he's so good and he's so powerful. That even some of our most hard hardships, our most hideous experiences can be used for good because we start to have a new perspective on other people's hurts, a new perspective on God's grace and his mercy. And we can actually minister and live in such a way that we now have opportunities that we never would have had unless we had the hardships and the struggles we had before. And that as much as we might want, and it's good to want it, to want out of these situations, that we should never miss the opportunity to use the struggles we're at now to be a blessing to someone else, to see what God wants to do in us to build character and to help love and show someone else the goodness of God. And then we talked, in the third message, we talked about community. How's it, there's, there's the old saying that like God never gives you more than you can handle. That's not true because it's not in Scripture. God will give you plenty more than you can handle. He does it on purpose because he requires that we live by faith. That means not by our understanding, our strength, but that we fully trust ourselves into him in every facet of our lives, which means he will routinely put us in situations that we have no capacity to handle emotionally, intellectually, physically, and we have to rely on him to get through and to see the goodness of his promises in our life. And that he most often reveals his goodness and shows his power through community. That we pray for God to do some miraculous thing, to part the clouds for the, the, you know, the, the ground, to just the trees to start actually growing money. Like we always talk to our parents talk to us as kids, like a tree, you know, money doesn't just grow on trees. We want God to just do some miraculous. And the truth is, is he wants to use people like you. He wants to use people like me to actually come together to love one another in such a way that we experience the love of God because the love of God has been poured into us. And now it is overflowing from us to one another. And people see the goodness of God, the love of Jesus, because how his people live amongst each other and that our healing for our hope and often even the answers for our hope come not when we're looking for other people to fulfill us but we engage in community and we start being the answer for hope in someone else's life within community and God starts to move and he starts to grow he starts to reveal gifts in us that we didn't know we had and there's this beautiful process that takes place in community and it's hard because we still get hurt by each other all the time all the time because we're all still in process. And then last Sunday, we talked for our Christmas Eve message, we talked about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and, and the struggle it must have been to have the promises that God gave her for her son, for the hope of the world, and to watch for 33 years to see all these promises seem like they're going in the wrong direction up to that moment where her son Jesus dies on a cross and she sees him buried in the tomb and to think that was everything God said was a lie. 
And that God calls us to faithfulness, to faithfulness, because sometimes the promises we think we are going to hold on to don't come the way we thought they were going to come. But what God promises every single one of us is more of his Holy Spirit. And we see that at Pentecost, that what everyone received because Jesus died and raised again is when you put your trust in him as your Lord and Savior, you receive the Holy Spirit. God himself comes to live inside of you to be your, your guide, to be the source of your love and your strength, your comfort. He's the guarantee of your eternal life with him. So this week, as we close this series, I wanted to look at hope redeemed in our life. Kind of what we talked about last week with Mary, but I wanted to go in a little bit deeper into that because the truth is, is we can hear something once, but, the, but we often, we want what we want. We want it the way we want it. We want it when we want it and how we want it. And so you go, yeah, 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 that's all good. But if we don't understand that sometimes the hopes we have, the way we see God's promises don't always come the way they think they do we can still leave ourselves to be disappointed, have those unmet expectations that God never gave us, and we can actually have these rocks. This, this, this soil of our heart actually gets rocky, and there's no root for God's word to actually grow in our life, for his presence to come f- full and alive inside of us. And so I want to talk a little bit tonight um, about what it looks like for God when he actually redeems things in our life and, and hope comes back to life. And some of the practical steps we can take to help pull some of these boulders of hurt out of our heart for when we have these unmet expectations or we have wounds from hope going unanswered in our perspective or we're just dealing with wounds and hurt in our heart and we're wondering where God is. And then finally, I want us to take a look, and this is the hard part, is is a hard look at ourselves and our perspective of who we are and what we actually deserve. Because if our understanding of who we are and what we actually deserve isn't right, our hope will be misplaced over and over again, and we'll live a life of disappointment, and the Word of God will continue to be a disappointment to us, and we'll be forced to either ignore it completely or twist it to fit our expectations and our experiences instead of understanding what God truly meant. Let's pray real quick. Lord, I, uh, I thank you so much. Lord, I'm going to thank you for this series, even though I'm not feeling it right now. I want to thank you for this season of my life, even though I'm not feeling it right now. I know you're doing something, and, and I don't feel at all capable uh, to continue to endure in this way. I'm humbled by you and your, your grace on my life. Lord, I just I just ask that we would just see you more clearly tonight. That who you are, your goodness, Lord, your goodness that surpasses all our understanding would come into clear focus and that we would understand the need and the power of your grace in our life. Jesus, that we would not be led by our experiences, but be led by your truth and your spirit. We just thank you and give you praise. Amen. I talked a bit about the depression I had about maybe almost two months ago that had come on for the first time in seven years, and I struggled with depression for the first time in a long time, and it was really just kind of leveling me. Um, and during that time, I, I just, I dealing with what felt like loss, what felt like just my heart being torn in two and, and not really understanding, you know, what, what the purpose was or, or what how God was going to do in that, this season of my life. Um, I felt like I was led to Job. And if you know the story of Job, Job uh, was a righteous man in the Old Testament and uh, he had 10 kids. And then Satan comes and says, look, Job serves you and loves you because you've put a hedge around him and you've made life easy on him. And you was, if you took everything from him, surely he would curse you. And so, God gives Satan permission to go and harass Job and do everything but kill him. And so over the course of uh, time, Satan takes everything. All ten children die. All his possessions are lost, and, and he, he, he is full of just welts and sores, and like he just loathes the day he was born. And there's this dialogue between him and four friends for the greater course of the book. And at the end, it says that God, God brought back 
more than what Job had lost in his life. He had more children, he had more livestock, he had more wealth, and it's like, oh man, how good is that? And, and I'm sitting in this moment of, of struggling, and I'm going, but yeah, I don't care how much you brought back or how much Job got, you got to know that that man hurt in his heart every day of his life for all 10 of those little babies, that he'd never hear those children giggle again. Those kids laugh. He'd never be able to hold them and hug them again. And, and God may have brought back, but the loss was still there, and the loss would be real the rest of Job's life. And it got me thinking about this idea that when we want God to redeem hope, when we want God to bring hope back, it, it often it comes back better than what we lost, but it doesn't mean the pain of what we lost always goes away. And that's the reality of it. There's some things we lose and we don't get them back this side of heaven. There's some things we lose and the pain is part of the process to make us more like Christ. And, and, and it's a good thing while the thing that happens is not good. It's a good thing because it helps us rely on God more. But in the moment, I can't even imagine what Job must have felt like. And so I shared the depression was broke when I confessed my, the, the, the struggle for perfection that I was dealing with. And we started in this series, and then another set of circumstances arose in my life. And I, I just, I started to feel this overwhelming pain and anger start to well up inside of me. And it felt like there was loss again. And, and there was just stuff going on in life that I, I'm not at liberty to share. Um, but it just, it started to really just weigh on my heart. And I realized that there was this anger coming out of me. And this, I, this feeling of loss was just overwhelming. And so the Lord, I, was, I went back to Job just like, okay, so what, what's, there's something in this. And I felt like the Lord said, I want you to go read beginning of Genesis. And so I just started reading the creation count where God speaks and, and, and creation is formed over seven days. He makes man, he makes Adam, and out of Adam, he makes Eve. And, and then we get to Genesis 4 and uh, Eve has two children. And it says in, in verse 1 of chapter 4 of Genesis, Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel and called his name. Nope, we're on the, not on that one yet. Thank you. Bore Abel. Now Abel is a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and the fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel or respect for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you and you must overcome it. When Adam and Eve took the fruit, it said that the fruit on the tree that brought sin into the world, the, the fruit on the tree was good for eating, it was pleasing to the eye, and, and it would give her wisdom. It had all these good things about it, and that's why Eve went and took the fruit. She didn't take the fruit because of the bad, the, the good and the evil. She didn't take it because of the evil. She took it because she saw what was good in it. In her natural estimation of this fruit, everything about the fruit was good, but it brought sin into the world. And what God said is that because you have disobeyed me, which that's all sin is, us disobeying God's will for our life. Because you have disobeyed me, the ground will be cursed, and there will be thorns and thistles will come through the ground. And by the sweat of your brow, you're going to have to work to produce anything of the ground. The ground was cursed. And so... Eve has these two beautiful baby boys and one ten sheep and he brings the best of his firstborn sheep and he brings them forward to God as a sacrifice and, and what, I, what I saw here was that there's this idea that all Abel did is he just trusted what God had gave. God was the giver of life. Their entire history, their family line was God breathed into something and it had life. And so Abel in faith just said, I don't need to present anything to God that isn't already his. I will just care from the depths of my heart for these creatures that are his. And I will bring the best of what he's given me to him. And God accepted it. And Cain went and worked out of his own effort and his own striving in the thing that God cursed himself and brought forward from the ground something from the Lord that the Lord already cursed. And this is so often what tends to happen in our life is that 
we think, and I have found myself in this situation numerous times in the last couple of months struggling with this, is we think that we have to actually produce something for God. That I have to go and work against that which is broken, that which is hard, and I need to work hard. And the harder I sweat, the more energy I put into it, the more passion I pour into it, the more God's going to appreciate it. And the more he should give me something back. And yet we see right out of the gate that that's not how God operates. He operates with faith. Find out in Hebrews that Abel's offering was in faith. It wasn't in effort. And Cain's was in effort. And so Cain gets jealous of his brother. And he meets him in a field and he kills him. Eve lost both her boys that day. One was dead and one refused to repent and was cast out and left. And he left bitter and jealous and angry. And Eve cries out to God because the hope of a future, she's been cast out of Eden. She's no longer in the presence of God and now her boys are gone and she's lost them. What does she hope for? And Adam comes to her again, and we can pick up. Here's the verse that I wanted to work out of to start the evening. Chapter 4, verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born and called his name Enosh. And at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Eve had lost her two boys. You see, in Old Testament times, and even in New Testament times, we read the Bible, often what happens is that people name their children with their purpose and their destiny in mind. Cain's name meant possession. God had given her a possession, a man to possess. God had given her this. The root of Cain's name, though, was to possess in a spear. And we see that right out of the gate with his story that what he wanted, he took by violent force. He possessed out of jealousy his brother by killing him. Abel's name meant breath. And the Lord just showed me, here's this moment, this woman who her very breath has been taken by the very thing God had given her. Hope is destroyed in a moment for this woman. And then her and her husband come together and they have a third child. And his name is Seth. And Seth means compensation. God has appointed. The word Seth in the Hebrew sounds like to appoint. And it literally means to compensate. God had set, he had appointed that he would compensate Eve for her loss. And this is so true of what he wants to do in our life is that the enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy, is what Jesus says, but I have come to give you life and life to the full. The enemy comes and he takes and he destroys, and God has appointed it in his goodness and his mercy and his love that he wants to compensate everything that you've lost. Everything you've lost, God intends to compensate. Doesn't mean the pain of Abel is gone for Eve. But God had appointed a compensation for what was taken by violent force. And then something interesting happened as I continue to read, and we're going to get a little academic for a moment before we get back into the heart of the matter, is that there is a series of names. We have Cain's lineage up until Noah in the flood, and we have Seth's lineage up until Noah in the flood. And there are multiple names that repeat themselves and names that are only off a letter or two. And there's something very interesting that I think the Lord has for us to see how he works in compensating us, not in a way we think, not in the time we think, but in a way that completely blows us away and and changes everything for our perspective. And so Seth has Enosh, which means man. It means the same thing as Adam. God is giving a second chance that humanity has been lost and God is setting up a second chance for him to do something, for man to do something. 
He is a second man. He is a restart. The beginning of God compensating what was lost in the garden, what was killed in that field. God is starting something new with Enosh. And his name means man, just like his grandfather Adam. And Enosh would have a boy named Canaan, who also means possession. But Canaan has a root word of to possess and a nest. That Canaan was a man who would receive possession by resting in what God had created to protect him. The nest was always the source in, in Hebrew literature, the source of divine favor, comfort, and protection up high away from danger. It is where the eagle would stay and watch from his lofty perch as God did all he did below him. The nest was above the cursed ground that Cain had worked and tried to earn his favor from. And Canaan, a man with the exact same name, was going to have a different possession. His possession was going to come from rest, from God's favor, because God would lift him above the curse to set him on a place to where he could not be touched. So we have two Cains that were presented. We have two options for life that were presented. Today, as, as we see, as, as God's orchestrating the names of these people that would carry on for the lineage of all mankind, we have one Cain that we can either continue to try to work, to please God, work for the hope and the promises of God by the sweat of our brow, take things by force, make them ours, the American way, or we can learn that whatever's taken from us, God promises to compensate and that we can just rest in his promises that he will compensate beyond our belief, beyond our understanding, what has been taken if we would just rest in him, if we would spend our time pursuing him. From both these lines came men named Enoch, which means dedicated. Cain's Enoch, the murderous son, was named after a city. He named a city rather after his son. It was pride. It was self-accomplishment. It was his own provision. It was his identity and value was, I did this thing. I built this fortress. I built this city that is great and known amongst the world. And I'm going to name my son the same thing. It was his own glory that he was creating. And it was his own dreams and his own desires that he was now promoting. And the other Enoch, meaning dedicated, was the one who walked with God. And if you know the story, he's, he's one of two men in the history of humanity that walked with God and never died because God just took him before his time because he walked with God. And we see that there's these two. We can work in our effort, which leads us to one place in our life. If everything I do is about my effort and my work and taking things by force and controlling my circumstances, that everything I have is going to be about me and my identity and what I can value out of what I can make. And I'm building a legacy for me out of the sweat of my own hands where I can trust that God will provide and I will walk and pursue him in relationship and be a friend of God. And from these two Enochs, from Cain's Enoch came Methusiel. Methusiel is one who interjects for God, one who speaks on behalf of God without authority. This is what happens when we try to make life about our own efforts, when we try to make life something that we can control and we can possess by our own strength and our own understanding, is that we start to get to a place that where we dedicate our entire life to all our work and all our understanding and all our accomplishments. And those experiences and that understanding leads us to a place where the only thing left for us to do is to make God's word fit our experiences. Because it's all about what I've done and it's not about what God has done or what God has promised. It's all about what I can control and what I can create. And so we start to change the truth of God's word in our very heart to something that has to do with us. This is what Jesus talked about. The unmet expectations. Cain's life, his jealousy led him not to see the promises of God that were spoken over him through his father and mother. And his entire lineage now is now starting to twist the very words of God. To speak for God in ways that God never intended man to speak for him. And from the other, Canaan was Methusheel. Two letters different. And from Methusheel... Oh, I'm sorry, Methuselah, which is a dart against your enemy. So for the man who, who walked with God, who rested in God in his high place that he put him, 
God gives him a dart against the enemy. And I thought about this as a dart is a small thing. It is not like the weapon of choice. If you're going to war, not many people go, give me the blow dart. Like that's, that's not what, you know, <laughs> they all got machine guns and there's tanks over there. It's like, give me the blow dart. I want that small, because I, I'm precise with that thing. And once I get the little frog poison on it, oh, he's over. It's going to be glorious. Like in our, in our understanding, if you're going to war, if you're going to attack your enemy, taking a dart to somebody is, is not the most effective way to take them down. Unfortunate story. When I was in my drinking days, we had a little too much fun one night, and my roommate, I was slumped up against the wall, and he used my chest as a dartboard. Young and dumb. Kids. Kids. Listen to me right now. Abusing alcohol is not as fun as it seems in the moment. The choices you make, some of them can last a lifetime. <laughs> you don't use a dart if you're going to war. But the truth is, is that no matter how little you may seem, in your estimation, no matter how small your resources, how, how small your abilities are, how weak you may feel compared to everyone else, if you're walking with God, if you're trusting in God, when He decides to use you against the very thing that you're hoping for justice for, it doesn't matter how small it is, in the hands of the Lord is the thing that will bring it down. You see, it doesn't matter who you are in the natural. All that matters is who lives inside of you. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote the Corinthians right out of the gate in chapter 1. He says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised the world, even the things that are not, the things that, that don't even matter, that don't exist. He chose those things to bring to nothing the things that are, the things that are established and strong and strongholds. That you don't need hardly anything in your life because when you decide to make God your resting place, your place of refuge and safety, and you pursue Him and you dedicate yourself to follow after the Lord with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, He can use whatever He has given you, how small and minuscule it may seem in the natural, to be the very dart that takes out the enemy that's oppressing you, the very thing that is holding you down and keeping your hope at bay. It does not matter who you are. It only matters who your king is. And so this young man is born and they both have boys named Lamech, meaning powerful. And from Cain's Lamech, this man of power, he's the first man to take multiple wives and he actually says that if, if Cain's vengeance was sevenfold, mine is 77-fold. He was a man of great violence and immorality, and yet his children were the ones that prospered over the earth. They were the ones that, that took over the herding. They even stole what Abel did and made it their own. They were the ones that created music with the lyre and with the flute. They were the ones who created bronze and, or, or rather, copper and iron weapons. And one of the daughters is the first woman to give an account for what she contributed in all the Bible besides Eve for her extravagant beauty. And it seems in this moment, this other Lamech, that he comes forward from, from this dart. He's this little dart, and he's, his name means powerful, but there's nothing of power in him. And he kind of laments his very situation. And when he has his son named Noah, he says this, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Here's a man of power and he's crying out, he has had enough. He can't stand the way the world is going anymore. There's been all this promise of what God will do to redeem his people that has been shared. And yet here's this man who's supposed to be powerful going like, I just, this boy's guy has to be it. Seth line up to this point has seen them. They're, they're, they've been murdered. They've been overlooked and they've had nothing. In Cain's line, the murderer, God has actually protected him and said that no one will touch Cain. And his descendants are powerful and they're changing culture and they're sweeping over the land and they have all the influence, all the money, all the fame. But one of Lamech's, two of Lamech's firstborn children have interesting names. Jabel and Jubal. Unfortunate for them. Never know who mom's really yelling at. One means 
a stream of water like a river. And the other means a stream, which in the Arabic actually translates to heavy rainfall. And the Lamech, who is poor and weak, has this young man named Noah, who means rest. In the midst of all this chaos, God is saying, just rest. Your hope is coming. You have nothing left, and it seems like everything is stacked against you, and that all the world is getting glory for getting eviler and more evil and more evil and going in all the wrong direction. People are prospering left and right, and you're doing the right thing, and it seems like it's actually going in the wrong direction. Just rest. Rest in the place on high that I've put you. Put your trust in me and just rest. Noah builds the ark. Most of us have probably heard this story. And the flood waters come, but it's interesting that what Genesis says is that it says waters come from two places, that the springs of the earth burst forward through the ground. The blood that had been crying out for Abel's justice released the water, the very pride of Lamech, his power came up against him and burst through the ground and flood, and the firmament above the heavens fell for 40 days and 40 nights like a river. The very thing that Seth's line had been waiting for came way, way later, but it would change everything. And God makes his first covenant with man. He makes it with Noah that he would never destroy the earth again, and that all of People on the earth would be blessed through the name of Noah. I think there's some of us in the room tonight feel like God has forgotten us. That we have dealt with injustice in our life and that God has not seen to set it right. That there are promises that you have been holding on to as you read scripture or have been prophesied over you. And it doesn't seem like God's actually moving in those areas. I come to tell you that God is not forgotten. That God is so amazing at weaving every minuscule detail of your life into the redemption, into the compensation that he has for you. And he is calling us to do a few things to just hold on to repent of what we know we need to repent of, to, to get into community and see how he's going to use one another to help shape and grow each one of us and to, and to treasure the word of God like Mary did, to know that I'm not going to let this promise get twisted in my heart and my mind because my experiences are saying that it's not working out the way I thought it should work out, but I'm going to treasure the truth of what God's word says. I'm going to treasure the truth of what he spoke in my life, and I'm not letting go no matter what. Even if it seems like hope dies right in front of me, that I'm not letting go. that we would find rest in the Lord above all else. That we would dedicate ourselves to him and he will, in his time, in his way, he will bring compensation for all that we have lost, for all that you have suffered. Jesus spoke to this in Matthew 19 when the rich young ruler comes and says, I, I, uh, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, sell all your possessions, give it to the poor and follow me. And, and he goes, whoa, that's too much. And he turns, and he walks away and says that Jesus looked at him and loved him, but he let him walk away. And in Matthew, the account of Matthew of this story, Jesus turns and he says to them, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. In Mark, it says many will receive a hundredfold in this life and the next. God promises, Jesus promises to compensate whatever you lose in pursuit of dedicating your life to him. It can be scary at times to think about actually stepping fully into the faith to, to see what God might actually have, to actually fully pursue the hope that he's put in our heart, but he promises that he will produce a hundredfold more. He will return and compensate a hundredfold more of whatever it is you lose in this life and in the next eternal life. But then he drops this bomb that exposes a rock under the surface of our hearts for most of us that we honestly probably don't even realize is there. But many who are first will be last. And the last will be first.
There are lies under the surface for most of us in some context or another. Bitter jealousy due to what we see as injustice in our life that prevents the potential of our promises. It pushes our promises down the road. It paralyzes God's power in us for the opportunities that we currently have even amidst our struggle. And it prevents God's presence from penetrating deep into our heart, into the soil, so his word can really take root. Cain killed his brother because he was jealous of him. Pastor Bill Johnson says that jealousy is just the seed. It's the conception of murder. And I was thinking about this. Is what happens is jealousy gets conceived in our heart. We get jealous because we see somebody else get something that we don't think they deserve. You know, like someone isn't working that hard at work and they get the promotion and you've been busting your butt and you're getting a pink slip. And you go, this isn't fair. And so we become to get jealous. And from jealousy, when jealousy gives birth, it comes out as an infant. It comes out as bitterness towards the individual. And bitterness towards God because he's not working on our understanding of fair weight and scales. And, and, And then from bitterness, when it grows into a teenager, bitterness grows into dishonor. And, and derelict nature towards people. And we start to speak and do things to undermine, and we start to actually come after. Instead of just holding our heart, we start to, when it starts to get a little bit more mature, we start to do things to undermine people because it's just not fair that this person hasn't had the struggles I've had. They haven't made the sacrifices I've made. They haven't paid the price that I've paid, and yet they're getting all this stuff in their life. All this goodness is happening. God, where are you? Where is justice? I have been pining away. I've been pursuing you. I've been staying, resting in your presence. I've been waiting. I've been treasuring your word. I've been doing all these things. And yet this person who does nothing seems like they're just getting everything they ask for. And from there, the last stop, but when we get to a point of such great dishonor, is murder. And for most of us, we'll never go there with our hands, but we'll go there with our mind and with our heart. And we'll stand as judge over someone that God is showing grace and mercy to. And the biggest thing I want to challenge us tonight is that this is the thing that stops the hope from becoming a reality in our life more than anything else. It's not understanding the grace of God. Jesus immediately addresses this. He says, the first will be last and the last will be first. And immediately he goes into this parable. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers in his vineyard. And after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And then he goes out at the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour. Over the course of 12 hours, he goes out numerous times and he brings people in from the, from the streets into the middle of the town. And he brings them out to work. And then they all line up and he pays those who have worked only an hour first. And he works all the way back to those who have worked 12 hours. And he pays the one who worked an hour first a denarius, a day's worth of work, a full day's wages. And everyone else in the back line that's worked three hours, six hours, nine hours, 12 hours is going like, yes. I agreed for one day's work and I worked a day. This is fair, but holy cow. I'm gonna, and then it gets to the next person. They get one denarius. And all the way to the last and everyone gets one denarius. And those towards the end start to grumble against this man. And it says in verse 11 of chapter 20 of Matthew, and on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house saying, the, the, these last worked only an hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, am I doing you some wrong? Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Another translation says, do you think, do you, is your eye bad because I am good? Is how you judge evil because I am good? And so the last will be first, and the first will be last. In the season right now, of feeling like, and it's pride. And it's, it, for me, it's formed to bitterness, where the jealousy is I feel like I have put forth certain efforts and time and sacrifices that others haven't, and I'm watching them get promoted around me. And I'm feeling tired and worn out, And bitterness started to grow in my heart. And there's no way as a leader of a church that that professes that our 
main point and goal in, in a ministry sense is to unite with other churches, bring unity to the body of Christ. Can we have that ever happen if competition and jealousy and bitterness towards other people's success when God blesses them is at the heart of my judgment or any of our judgment? And the truth is, is, is in the natural, it makes sense. A guy worked 12 hours and a guy worked one hour. They should be paid differently. Sometimes God is fair. All the times God is gracious. Let me say that again. Sometimes God is fair and you get exactly what you work for, but all the time God is gracious. When we stand in judgment of other people that we don't think are up to the quality of what they should be for what they're given or what they're making or how they're being blessed or thought of, we put ourselves in the seat of God. Worse, we actually put God in the defendant's chair and we sit as judge. Saying that your grace, what this person hasn't earned that you're pouring out, your mercy, what you're overlooking in their life and still blessing them is not okay by me. Jesus says, you will be forgiven as you forgive. So I've been wrestling with this in this series, my, my hope for things that God has promised me and that he's promised this church. And, and I've been wrestling with the fact that I, I'm struggling with jealousy and bitterness towards some people. So I feel like I'm doing things that I wasn't supposed to have to do. And they get to do whatever it is that they want to do right now, even though they said they, they would do something else. And it's been destroying me this last week. And the only thing God said is, I want you to look at my grace for you. We can, we, we can add up how unfair it is we can look in the natural and go, look, I've, I've put in 40 hours and I've given $100,000 or whatever it is you've done to ministry. And yet, God, all I've asked is that you just give me this gift of, of prophetic. And yet this person who comes in off the street, they're still strung out. They receive you and they start prophesying right away. They didn't even ask for it. My child was dying in the hospital. When did you show up, God? And someone else hasn't done nothing. They showed up once the church got prayed for and their dying child is completely healed and mine's probably going to die in the next couple of days. And I've been pining away. I've fasted. I've prayed. I've done everything that your word says I need to do to show myself faithful. Where are you now? We can get there real easy because it makes sense in our natural minds to look around and we have our own scales and weights of what is good and what is bad and who's working well and who's working not so well, who's spiritual, who's not spiritual. We have all these things. Who's invested the time to be tenure in the church? Who hasn't? Who's, who's done whatever it is? We have all these ways in which we judge one another and then we sit there and we cry out to God, God, why aren't you doing the thing that you promised? Where's the hope that I was holding on to? And could it be that some of the testing and the trial that puts pressure on the word that God wants to see if we're faithful is not always what we're going through, but is it sometimes the greatest test and trial of whether we'll hold on to the word of God is what he actually gives someone else when he refuses to give it to us. What do we do when someone in our estimation less worthy gets what we've desperately wanted? What does our heart do? James, James 3, 13 through 16. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts. Do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, it is unspiritual, and it is demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. It's wisdom. You're seeing things fairly accurately. It's just earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. I had to come to grips with that the other day. 
been aligning my thoughts with demonic thoughts about what's fair and what's not. What's mine and what's not, what God gives, and sometimes what he doesn't. Why does God's mercy and goodness and favor in someone else's life make me jealous? Ask yourself that. What does that say about my heart? What does it say about our heart? And Jesus says, if you cannot, if you cannot steward natural things, how will you be given heavenly things? If I can't steward someone else's success with joy, how can I ever be entrusted with the joy of success that God's promised me? How can I ever be trusted to be humble and to use it well if I can't celebrate God's mercy and his grace on someone else's life? his overwhelming goodness to someone else, if I can't steward that with a thankful, happy heart and give praise to God, how am I ever going to be trustworthy to steward the goodness that God's promised for me in my life? My heart won't be able to bear it. And I'll dedicate it to self-glory like Cain did, and I'll work by my brow, and I'll say, look what I've done, and how great I am. Verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I was driving Friday, and I'm wrestling with these things, these people, these circumstances, and I want to close with this, and it's a confession, because if we're going to be vulnerable, it has to start here first. Well, before I was driving, I was at home with my wife, and I hadn't spent a single moment preparing for tonight, on Friday afternoon. And I sat on the couch, and my wife goes, are you procrastinating? I go, oh, it's way worse than procrastinating. I feel like a fraud. I feel like a complete fraud. Because I have allowed jealousy and bitterness to overwhelm my heart, and I haven't even cracked my Bible open in five days. And all I can sit here and think is that how good God has been to me, and yet I don't even have the heart to open the Bible to, to even read for five minutes. And we talked, and my wife said something really profound. She goes, you need to just receive God's grace that unmerited favor and love that he has for you because you're his son, not because you've done anything. And I broke. I got in the car. I drove, and I was going to go do some sermon prayer at a coffee shop, and poor Jason had called me. and then He had texted, then called, and I, it was like three hours. I hadn't even responded. I was so avoiding any responsibility. No major sin, just bitter, jealous of other people's success a season where I feel like I've just been getting my butt kicked for about a year and a half, two years straight. And I had to tell Jason the same thing. He's a good friend. He goes, well, should we just do a worship night? And I, I, I can't put my garbage on Holly's plate. <laughs> Last second like this. And I cried again. And I sat down and I read, and for about an hour, nothing came. And then yesterday, I got up, sat, and read. For about an hour, nothing came. And this morning, sat, read. For about an hour, nothing came. And I had had this, this word just brewing in my heart about what it does when jealousy and bitterness towards God's goodness towards others starts to take a place and, and it roots itself in us is the very hope you're waiting for gets delayed at minimum. If at worst, it gets lost. So I want to leave you with a few practical things. That we submit to God by resting in Him and dedicating ourselves to Him even when it's hard and it's hard to see any good. That we learn to celebrate even if we don't feel it when God does good to others, especially those whom we don't understand how they could ever deserve what God's doing in their life. Because if we can start to do that, then we can start to grow the foundation, the character that we need 
to be able to steward the promises that God has for us. And then love is action. You cannot, as John says, you can't love, you can't love a God who you don't see and refuse to love a brother that you do see. Because if there's people in our lives that we have a hard time, and I'm in the midst of figuring out what this looks like, if there's people in our lives that we have a hard time being happy for, to force ourselves to fake it till you make it, celebrate and praise God for his goodness in their life until he starts to change your heart and then find a way to serve him. Find a way to serve him. And then finally, just receive the grace that God has for you. And this is what I found that Friday afternoon is that as I had done nothing to prepare for tonight, and I had done very little for last week. And last week I drove home and I praised God last Sunday because God showed up when I had nothing left and I really didn't bring much to the table. And I told, I, I told my wife and I told Jason, is look, I, 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 God's grace right now is overwhelming me and I feel his love in such a powerful way, not because I, I'm doing so well or I have such a great perspective on life, but because I am overwhelmed by the fact that I don't deserve any of this. And yet he's still sustaining me. Now, if I want to see the promises of God, I'm going to have to get in line with what God has for my life, as is, does any of us. But God's grace, at minimum, will always sustain you in every season, in every trial. So I had to just stop and thank God for all the goodness he's done to me that I never deserved. And my heart started to shift. God wants to reveal amazing things in each one of our lives. The hope that he's put deep down inside of you. The passions that he stirs deep down inside each one of us. And he has things in his word that we've, that we've read. If you've been in the word that he's promised that may not seem like reality now. But when we start to walk in repentance when we start to celebrate his goodness everywhere we're at, when we start to dive into community and letting people speak into our lives and, and have a voice and how God's forming in us, and when we, we start to take opportunities in the midst of our struggle, instead of just looking for ways out, God will start to unwrap something inside of you that will bring more life and more hope. And it will wash away all that was broken and restore the hope that he put in your heart at first. And he will compensate you with much more than you ever deserve or ever could imagine. It doesn't mean the loss won't hurt, but the compensation will be worth it. Let's pray. Lord, right now, I just, uh, I just want to thank you that I am not judge that I do not get to decide where your goodness extends, how your grace gets poured out, how your mercy gets given to people, that I am not the one that gets to assess who deserves what, Lord, because I, I, I am an utter mess myself, and I will take all that you are willing to offer. Lord, I, I, right now, if, if you are holding jealousy and bitterness in your heart towards individuals because you don't see them, is worth the situation in life where you just wish you think you deserve what they've got. I, I just invite you, everyone's heads are bowed to just raise your hands. I want to pray with you because I'm struggling with it right now too. There's people in your life that you just, God, how could you be this good while letting all this bad go on? Lord Jesus, we come before you right now. We just ask you to just do a work in our heart to give us a new understanding that we would see them as you see them. That we would be filled with love for these individuals that we're having a hard time with, that we would just be filled with joy at anything good that comes their way, that we'd be able to celebrate you because it shows your goodness and your mercy and your grace, and that we will stand in the confidence of knowing that you have good things for us too. And that your grace abounds more and more and more every day. And there's nothing I need to fear of lack, but you will provide everything I need and then some. So, Father, help me to walk in forgiveness and walk in repentance of holding these things in my heart over your children. 
that you are working on, Lord, just like you're working on in me. Lord, I ask that you would bless them right now in Jesus' name, that you'd pour out your spirit on them, that your love would fall on them, and that they would see you in new ways, and that they would have new encounters with you, and they would be filled with the power of your Holy Spirit. I just thank you, Lord, for what you've done in my life, and I give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.